1 Corinthians 13 this morning. <clears throat> We've been going through chapter 12 and 13, and eventually we'll get to 14. And these are all the, the big section about spiritual gifts and uh, very, very important. And sort of the, the book end to that is... Uh, chapter 14 verse 40 says let all things be done decently and in order that's one of the overarching keys as far as church and, and spiritual gifts and ministry is God doesn't want you know people just standing up and speaking in tongues and somebody else standing up and and, and shouting some prophetic message and and uh, so it's very important and then if you still have more questions regarding you know, gifts and, and ministry. If you remember last week at the end of chapter 12, that the Apostle Paul actually ranked the spiritual gifts. And, and, and which gift, does anybody remember, was ranked the lowest? The gift of tongues. Yeah. Kind of the one that, that, that was in, in, the, in the fight, it, that people were, I got to have this, this is the best gift. And, and, you know, you're not spiritual. Have you ever heard somebody say that? You are not spiritual unless you've spoken in tongues. You are not where God wants you to be. I've actually heard people say that. People, I've heard people say that. People have told that to my wife. You are not spiritual unless you've spoken in tongues. But Paul says, hey, tongues are actually on the bottom of the list. They're the least important. They're the lowest priority. And in fact, nowadays, we don't even need the gift. It's not even in existence anymore because, uh, you know, we can, there's missionaries that speak all these languages around the world that everybody can be witness to. Okay, so uh, it's just interesting when you get in conversations with these people that believe about tongues. Uh, but all of the answers are in the Word of God. All of them. Okay, so we're going to pick this up in uh, verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 13, and I'm in the New King James uh, Version. It says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely, does not seek its own is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will fail. Where there are tongues, what does it say? They're going to cease. They're going to stop. Eventually, they're going to stop. Now, we in our Baptist tradition believe that the the gift of tongues ceased about the time they stopped writing the, the New Testament. You know, by the time John was done uh, with that special revelation, writing the book of Revelation, that's when those, those, those special miracles where God was actually speaking directly to people, that's, that's when it all stopped. Healing, tongues, all stopped right about then. So uh, Paul even says they're, they're going to cease. Now, it's interesting when you go talk to some of these people that really believe in tongues. Do you know when they say they're going to cease? Well, when we get to heaven, that's when they're going to cease. We're all going to be able to talk and understand each other in heaven. But then some people say, no, no, no. Uh, we're going to speak at that, that what we're speaking down here is the heavenly language and, and we're making this special connection with God and, and we're going to talk that way in heaven. So some people, they're never going to cease. But you look at this verse, clearly it says, tongues will cease. 1 Corinthians 13, 8. You can mark it down. And where there's knowledge, even that will vanish away. But, but the key there is love never fails. So in these verses, uh, we, say, we see 15 descri descriptions of love. And I actually have a spreadsheet that I've made up with the English word, the original Greek word, the meaning, and sort of how uh, a brief description of how to apply that. And, and uh, maybe next week I'll have Dawn, uh, it takes a legal size paper because it's, it's really big, 
uh, maybe we'll print out maybe a dozen of those those spreadsheets with those 15 descriptions of love if, if anybody wants that or take that home and, and look at it maybe that'll help you in your studies but 15 descriptions of love I think it'll take us a couple weeks to get through them all uh, but as we look at these 15 descriptions of love I want us I want you to ask yourself this question how does my life and ministry match up to these descriptions of love? How does my life and ministry match up? What does my life look like uh, in, in comparison uh, with these descriptions of love? Okay, so 1 Corinthians 13 this morning in verse 4, what is the first description of love class? Anybody? Huh? It suffers long. Love suffers long. Or does anybody have another version that says something different? Patient. Love is patient. That's the old version, right? Uh, so a lot of us have the King James Version memorized, don't we? So we remember, love is patient. Uh, the new version says, love suffers long. The Greek word is makrothumai. And it's basically is the ability to be wronged and not retaliate. You remember that John Wayne movie where he said, I will not be wronged, I will not be insulted, I will not be laid a hand on? Remember that? And if you do, what's, what's the implication? He's going to shoot you. Right? That is, that, is, that is far away from this description of love. This is love suffers long. Love is patient. Love gives you the ability to be wrong and not retaliate. Now the root word, the Greek root word, uh, means to, has a long fuse. You ever heard, had a parent say that? Oh, uh, my fuse is about lit, right? But the Greek uh, for love would be it has a long fuse. One writer said that the word is always used with people in mind, that this long suffering is not about patience during circumstances and events, but it is always referring to patience with people. So this patience that God is telling us to have was actually, uh, back then, and even nowadays, people think patience with people is a weakness. Have you ever heard that? Don't put up with that. That's a weakness. You know, back then especially, and, and Aristotle said that not tolerating any insult or injury and always being ready to strike back was a virtue. Aristotle. Basically, the strong, good people never let anyone get away with anything. But God teaches something the exact opposite. Love is patient. Love suffers long. Now, Jesus Christ is obviously the greatest example of long-suffering with people, right? Uh, remember the, just a few hours before he was killed, uh, what did people do to him? They lied about him. Remember the false witnesses making up all the stories? They mocked him. Remember the, the chief priests and the Pharisees uh, slapping him in the face, punching him in the face, making all these insults? Do you remember the soldiers? If you're the king, do something about it. If you're really God, as they pulled out his beard and beat him, and then finally, they, they killed him. Right? What did Jesus say? Luke 23, verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. He said, Father, forgive them. That, that's kind of the, the perfect picture of what it means when, when it says love is patient. Love suffers long. I mean, what would our homes look like if we really had that type of love, patience? Long suffering. What type of job? What type? What would our church look like if no one ever looked for revenge or ever thought how how can I get that person back? How many here have ever thought I'll show them? I'll show them. 
Class, aren't you glad? God has never thought that. God has never thought that. I'm so glad that God is perfectly patient. Now I say that because I've wronged him before. Lots and lots and lots and lots of times. I've hurt his feelings. I've broken my promises to him. I've directly disobeyed his commands. I've even been hypocritical while preaching from the pulpit. But I'm still here because God's got his love and he suffers long. He's patient. He's patient. 1 John 4, 8 says, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. That's, that's who God is. He's love. So, love is patient. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. What's the next one? Love is kind. Love is kind. Now, the Greek word for kind is uh, kerestata, and it means to be useful. It's to be useful to someone else. Now, immediately follows this idea of long-suffering or patience because kindness is sort of that next essential sort of aspect of love. So with love, we not only need to be long-suffering, which is not retaliating, uh, but also actually look uh, for opportunities to, to be kind, to help someone. So instead of not paying back somebody with evil, Kindness is actually looking to pay them back with good. So not only is love patient, it's also kind. So they kind of piggyback off one another there. Uh, Matthew 5 verse 44 says, I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, and do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. So uh, not just... Well, I, I'm going to be patient with them. That's, that's not good enough. We actually have to be step out in love and be kind. So once again, we're, we're confronted with the idea that love is an action. It's actually stepping out and doing something. You know, sometimes we listen to music and you, I don't know if you ever flip through the channels on the radio. It seems like every song is about love or some aspect of love. You know, you can turn on a television or a movie, and, and they're all talking about how love is a feeling, or love is touching, or love is this. And uh, uh, what we see in Scripture is you won't always have warm and cushy feelings for your enemies. Jesus says, love your enemies. So that, that would be, be kind to your enemies. We're not always going to feel like we love our enemies, but we can do good for them. We can love them. We can be kind to them. Have you ever thought, you know, just after you've been misused or hurt in some way, how can I be kind to that person? <laughs> That's not a natural feeling. But love is patient and love is kind. Now what's the next one? What's the next description of love? It doesn't envy. It, yes, love does not envy. Or maybe have a version that says love is not jealous. So the Greek word there for envy is uh, to boil. So the, the picture is that envy is something that's building up inside of us, sort of boiling, and, and it begins to steam and then finally boils over until you cannot control yourself anymore, like that, that pot on the pan that sort of boils over and gets all that nasty junk on the pan and on your stove top. And, and uh, uh, you know, you, you finally boil over in envy and, and you, you speak out and you say something. Uh, I want what you have. Or and it's this massive explosion. Uh, envy can actually go deeper than, than jealousy. It can go from wanting someone else's stuff to actually wishing that they didn't have it. Like, I, I don't even care if I have that. I just don't want them to have it. And, and, and I think that second part is what King Solomon uh, had in his mind when he wrote in Proverbs 14, 
Envy is rottenness to the bones. See, envy was a problem in the, the church of Corinth. And in the context, the people were envious over spiritual gifts. Everybody wanted to speak in tongues, right? And to the point that some people were faking speaking in tongues just to look cool. So Paul had to say, guys, no, no, no. Tongues is actually the least important gift. Look again there at 1 Corinthians 12, uh, where it says, uh, verse, verse 28, God's appointed these, the church, first apostles, second prophets, then teachers, uh, and then he starts ranking gifts, miracles, gifts of healings, gifts of helps, gifts of administration, and then at the very bottom, varieties of tongues. Right? They were, they were envying, they wanted the gift of tongues, and, and actually, it, it, that's the, the least important gift there is. And, and envy, God says in chapter 3, verse 3, uh, 1 Corinthians, that um, it made these, this church carnal. They were carnal because they were envious over spiritual gifts. One preacher said envy was the, the first sin. I don't know if you've ever heard that before. Uh, Eve thought in her mind, I want to be like God. Uh, I want what God has. So she ate the fruit. She bought Satan's lie. Uh, you know, and the stick didn't fall far from the tree, right? Because Cain envied Abel. He, he, God didn't accept his unworthy offering. And, you know, the list could go on and on with envy. Obviously, it started with Satan. I want to be like God. Then he convinced Eve of the same thing. And then Cain. And, and, and our names could be added to that list. I remember I was at college. And I was a preacher boy. And a lot of preacher boys in class. And every year, towards the end of the year, the, the preaching professor got to pick the, the top three preachers to students to preach in chapel. And my senior year, I'm thinking, I did really well in preaching class. I got this perfect grade, right? I'm kind of in the back of your mind, you're like, I wonder if I'll be that guy. You, you kind of want that, I guess. And, and he picked three people, not me. So in my head, I began thinking of all the reasons why you know, he picked them. Uh, one of the things was, is my bill was totally paid for. And, and part of that, you got a thousand dollar scholarship for, for the preaching scholarship. So they would, have, the college would have to actually issue me a thousand dollar check, which there's no way they were going to do that. Right. So that's why they didn't pick me. That, that's what my mind said to myself. You know, that's why they didn't pick me. And then, then I kept thinking of other reasons uh, all the, the preachers he picked were all married. So the professor had a, a soft spot, you know, for them guys, uh, help them pay their bill. You know, they're married and, you know, I wasn't married. So, you know, I, I had all these reasons why I wasn't chosen. I never thought the obvious. They were better preachers than me. <laughs> right? <laughs> Isn't that the obvious? But that, that envy uh, clouded my mind. That clouded my judgment, clouded my thinking. And that, that envy is something I think that we all uh, struggle with at times. But love does not envy. So now, it's hard not to be envious of someone who's better than you. Uh, but God says, when someone's popular, when they're rich, when they're successful, when they're gifted, what are we supposed to do? Rejoice. Rejoice with them. Rejoice in others' accomplishments. Don't be envious. So that, that's the only thing that can beat envy is, is love, right? So, uh, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. What's the next one? It's verse 4, right? Are we still in verse 4? 1 Corinthians 13. It's not boastful. It's not boastful or it does not parade itself. Um, one of the other versions says vaunteth not itself. Uh, love does not parade itself. 
So this is basically a, a type of verbalizing your pride. And the Greek word there for uh, uh, paradeth itself, the Greek word uh, could be translated literally windbag. And it's the only time that this Greek word is used in the New Testament. Kind of interesting if you like digging deeper in the text. But uh, So the same way long-suffering and kindness positively went together, this envy and boasting negatively go together. Uh, envy is wanting what someone else has, and boasting is making somebody else want what you have. Oh, God. You know, and the other people are sitting there like, what? I'm just, that's just gibberish. You're fine. You know, it's, sometimes when people say that, it just sounds like gibberish in my mind. Like, they, they have all this great stuff, but they're really trying to get you to want it. Right? Um, a, a married couple was bragging constantly about how rich, how important, and how influential their respective families were. Finally, the husband got fed up and said, Okay, I have to admit it. Your in-laws are much better than mine. You get it? Yeah, because his parents brag. But anyhow, um, people brag. That was a dumb joke. I got I to gotta redeem myself now. It was good. It just took a minute to get it. It needed to be up on the screen so you could digest it. So oftentimes that this parading oneself, have you ever seen this where it becomes a competition? Like there's a few people there and oh I, I did this, well oh, I, I did this, and oh, you know and it, it gets bigger and bigger and involving many people telling each other how important they are, how much better they are. Well, the truth is. We probably all have something that we're reasonably good at. And, and sometimes we enjoy letting other people know about it. Um, my dad, he's not here, otherwise I'd really pick on him, but my dad's a magician with concrete. He's been working with concrete since 1979, so over 40 years. And he knows how to finish it, he knows how to pour it, he knows how to test it. When, when they have problems uh, with the mix of the concrete, they've been on, this was 20 years ago, an entire load of concrete was $1,000. Now it's, now it's more than that, but back then that was a lot of money. And they were doing these bridge decks in, in Flint on I-69 and 475. And the owner of the concrete company was, was running the concrete plant and he ruined three loads in one night. $3,000 down the drain. They called my dad in in the middle of the night. He went in, he fixed the mix design, and the owner said, listen, all the rest of the night, of course, for the rest of the year, you have to do them. Because, because dad is just a magician with concrete. My father-in-law, Ed, is an incredible woodworker. He is like... When I build something, I just like, oh, it needs to be about this big. I start cutting and screwing it together. Ed actually draws the boards on a piece of paper and pre-plans all of his cuts. And at the end of the day, he just has these little pieces of scrap left. When I'm done building, I have like six foot chunks and all these pieces notched out. And then it's this big pile of stuff. And, and Ed is like just incredible and he's taught me a lot about woodworking. In fact, he's helped me build uh, the crib for my kid's bed. He helped me build and did most of the changing table uh, for the kids. And uh, we did some other projects too. Uh, but one thing I've noticed about Ed, my father-in-law and my dad, uh, Tom, I've never heard them talk about how good they are with concrete or woodworking. I mean, those are their areas of expertise, but they, they never talk about it. So to me, that's an example of love does not parade itself, those two guys. And, and this, is, this is Jesus. This is our Savior, right? Jesus in John 12, 49 said, 
I only speak about the Father. That's all I've come to do. I come by His authority, and that's who, all I talk about. See, Jesus wasn't there to talk about Himself. He wanted to speak about the Father. And how many honestly could say at the end of the day, eh, I'm, not, I'm not talking about myself. I'm not praying to myself. And that's, that's love. That's love. So the, the application question is, who is the topic of conversation in our lives? Is it God or is it us? Is it how great we are or how great God is? So I think the, the challenge is we kind of break each point of what love is, these descriptions of love. I think the challenge is uh, uh, when we get here to speak less about our accomplishments and work on speaking more about Jesus Christ and his accomplishments. Okay, that, that's, that's, that's love. So love is patient, love is kind, love is not, does not envy, and love does not parade itself. And what's the next one? It's not puffed up or it's not conceited. It's not conceited. So if parading it's oneself as verbal pride, puffed up is the attitude behind it. It's the attitude of pride, the prideful attitude. And that's basically one of the, the big problems in the Corinthian church. They, they, they had this attitude of pride. We could go back through the book and 1 Corinthians 4, 6 says they were puffed up about people, uh, Chapter 4.18 says they were puffed up about past teaching. Chapter 5, verse 1 says they were puffed up because they were sexually tolerant. Remember that story? There was the, the man that had an affair with his mother-in-law. And they're just like, they're just like, oh, it's fine. We're, we're tolerant of, of all sexual preferences. Chapter 8, verse 1 says they were puffed up about knowledge. I mean, all throughout, you, you could do that, that word study in 1 Corinthians and see, wow, this church had a problem with being puffed up. I mean, they thought they were the best. They thought they were the most tolerant. They thought that they had the best preachers. They thought they were the most spiritual church. I mean, Paul had started a bunch of churches all throughout the world, and, and he was often traveling, and I'm sure you've seen the map where all the places Paul went, where all the churches were, and, and they would look at that map, and they, they knew about all the other different churches. I'm sure they had correspondence back with one another, and they were actually literally sitting there in their pews or chairs or whatever they had, and they were thinking, we are the most spiritual church. They legit thought that. They thought that they had all the answers, and really, they were just puffed up. So Paul says, love is not puffed up. Okay, you know, that's a really important aspect of love. Love suffers long. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not pray to itself. Love is not puffed up. I read this story about two men walking on a very narrow ledge along a mountain trail side. And, and they actually came to each other face to face on the trail. And they, they tried to wiggle past one another, but the ledge was very small. And, and they sort of talked about it. And going back either way would be a long ways. And, and they, they couldn't go do that. And, the, you know, there was different reasons for that. And uh, all of a sudden... One guy, without saying a word, just lays down on the trail. And the other guy actually walked over top of him. So that's, that's love. Being able to give uh, yourself up. Uh, you don't mind getting walked on. You just want to do something for the benefit of someone else. And, and that's what Paul is after in the, in the Corinthian church. If you could only minister in a non-retaliating, self-sacrificial way, returning kindness instead of always avenging yourself or bragging about your, yourself, then, then your spiritual gifts would mean something. So if we want our spiritual gifts to mean something, 
they need to be done in love. So, uh, where are we at now? Verse 5. five. we got a few minutes left. Does not behave rudely. Love does not behave rudely. I got another joke for you. You want to hear it? Since, is it? Can I redeem myself? There was this really godly Bible college student who had made it his goal in life to base everything he did on God's word. He always felt he was on solid ground if he could quote a chapter and verse from the Bible for everything that he did. And he assumed that God's word was his, his guide for his thoughts, words, and actions. He just, his goal is to please God. Well, this young man did everything right until he began to fall in love with this beautiful young lady from his college. And after several dates, he very much wanted to give her a kiss good night, but he could not find a verse for that. So he would just walk her over to her dorm and softly say, Good night. This went on for several weeks. And all that time that young preacher boy was searching the Bible trying to find a passage that would allow him to give his girlfriend a kiss. He couldn't find one. Finally, he came across Romans 16.16, 16, which says, Greet one another with a holy kiss. Right? He thought at last, I have a Bible verse to, to, to prove giving my girlfriend a kiss good night. But just to be sure, he went and checked with one of his professors. Now that's a big mistake. It's because it's always better to ask forgiveness than to ask permission, right? <laughs> After talking with the professor, he realized that the passage was talking about a church setting and not a dating situation. The wise professor explained, in the Middle Eastern culture of the early Christian church, it was common for people to kiss one another on the cheek. So once again, the young man was without a proof passage to justify kissing his girlfriend goodnight. Well, that evening, he walked his girlfriend back to her, her dorm, and as usual, he said, good night. But as he did, she grabbed him, pulled him in close, and gave him this big kiss. After a few seconds, the young man pulled away, and he was saying, Bible verse, Bible verse, Bible verse. <laughs> and the girl pulled him in a second time, and just before kissing him again said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. <laughs> You know, the, the young man was searching a verse about kissing and not a lot of verses on that, but a lot of verses on love, right? A lot of verses on love. So uh, one writer said that he did an extensive search of the scriptures and he found 650 verses on love in the Bible. So we don't have to go far. We can learn what God expects uh, it, with us in regards to love. Now, one interesting thing to note is we study these famous verses in the Bible on love, you know, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5, and all the way down through 8, um, is that the Greek word here for love talks about a self-sacrificing love. And that's the same kind of love that Christ had for us when he died on the cross. I don't know if you remember last week we talked about some of those other Greek words for love, but, but this is the self-sacrificing. It's the giving of yourself. So we've looked at love does not behave rudely. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Love is patient. Love is kind. Uh, love does not envy, does not pervade, pervade, uh, parade itself, and it's not puffed up. Now we're on verse 5. Love does not behave rudely. Okay? 
So rude in the Greek simply means poor manners or could be translated out of place. Love is not out of place. Now, rudeness comes in many forms. It can be crudeness. It could be bad behavior. It could be impoliteness. And rudeness can happen at home, uh, in church, at work. Uh, it can happen in all types of different places. Uh, uh, and people, people can move beyond this rudeness to, to being very crude very quickly. Now, one thing we need to be teaching and reminding of ourselves is uh, very often in all these different settings is love is not rude. Right? Love is not rude. Uh, I often have to be reminded that uh, love is not rude. Uh, like if a man is slurping his soup in, in front of his guest and his wife says, stop, that's rude. Love says, stop. If uh, the wife is picking the lint from in between her toes at the dinner table, she needs to stop. That's, that's rude. That's rude. Um, if children are acting rude, they need to be taught what true love is. Right? That's, that's love. Now, rudeness sometimes happens in church. Uh, sometimes people even imply that the Holy Spirit has prompted them to act this way. One pastor told the story how he was called in the middle of the night. He was a veteran pastor. This was from a few decades ago. And uh, he was accustomed to being called in the middle of the night, and he knew usually that meant something very bad was happening. Instead, it was a church member informing him that the church phones were not shut off like they were supposed to be according to their church policy. And he just knew the Lord would want to, him to let the pastor know about this policy violation. Rudeness, right? So as Christians, we need to be careful in the way we tell other people even about salvation that Jesus Christ offers. Can we be rude about that? So while we're trying to be good, while we're trying to be spiritual, we have to display love and not be rude. So what's next? What's the next one? Verse 5. Love is not rude. Love, selfish. love is not selfish, right? Love does not seek its own. So this is one of those ones that sort of piggybacks off, off the prior ones. So it's building off rudeness. Uh, now, selfishness is stubbornness, possessiveness, demanding, always wanting to have everything go its own way. So selfish people don't care about things going on around them. And uh, one of the descriptions we see about the church, especially in this context, is the church is what? A, it starts with ba and ends in adi. Body? It's a body, right. Church is, <laughs> church is a body. Now, a body is more than just a, a, a team or a congregation. It's a living thing, right? We are the body of Christ. So there's no room for people to always have everything go their way. Right? God's word teaches that the things we need, that we do, need to be with the good of others in mind, not ourselves. So once again, in context, we know that this is talking about spiritual gifts. So look at chapter 14, verse 4. It says, He who speaks in a tongue edifies who? Himself. She's just doing it all for yourself. Right? But he who prophesies, which is standing up and teaching or preaching or, or giving some encouraging words, right? That actually truly edifies the church. Verse, verse 12. Skip back to verse 12. Even so, you are very zealous for spiritual gifts, but let your gifts be done for the edification of the church, building up the church. It's not about you. Right? Our gifts are for the benefit of others. You remember that song? Others, Lord, yes, others, let this my motto be. Why are you giving me that cringe look? It wasn't that bad. It can be better. 
Even when I kneel to pray, my prayer shall be for others. So, uh, love does not seek its own. I'm going to cry myself to sleep tonight, Sean. <laughs> love does not seek its own. What's the next one? Irritable. Love is not irritable. That must be a new translation. I didn't even see that one. Uh, my version says love is not provoked. Okay, love is not provoked. What's what's your say, David? Um, easily angered. Easily angered, yeah. So the Greek word here is referring to sudden outbursts. Or you could say, you know, love is does not have a bad temper. Now, there is something interesting to note here. The original King James uh, version says love is not easily angered. The word easily is not there in the Greek. And when we say love is not easily angered or easily provoked, that is implying that we are allowing for some sudden outbursts as long as they're not easily provoked. Right? Just make sure that that the, the provoking or the anger, it's, it's sort of you've allowed to build up over time and, and then you can sort of blow up. Many of the commentators in the 1600s, remember the King James Version was 1611, they, they started writing about how that was an incorrect insertion of a word that really clouded the meaning of the text. Easily should not be there. A hundred years before the King James Version was translated, the, the Bible translator William Tyndale translated that same verse is not provoked. Love is not provoked. Love is not anger. That, that word easily isn't there. And, and that's because that's what it means. Uh, the, the verses should be, could be said, love does not lose its temper ever. Love never has sudden outburst. It's not like, oh, oh, oh you, can, is, you can just throw in easily there's another important note here, the Greek word for provoked. It's used in this exact form only once, and a derivative is used one other time. Uh, the same exact word is used in Acts, Acts 17, 16. It says, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him, and when he saw the city that when he saw that the city was giving given over to idols. So in that case, Paul was provoked, but he, what was he angry at? The sin of idol worship. Right? He's, he's provoked. He's angry with the sin of idol worship. So what do we call this? Righteous anger. You ever heard that, that phrase before? And, and we can look back in, in times of Jesus' life when he was provoked, when he was angry at sin. Right? Do you remember when he cleared out the temple? But the anger is always directed towards sin. It's not, it's not necessarily directed at people, it's the sin. So the only provoking, well, the only stirring up that we are supposed to do with people is actually found in, in Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider how we might provoke each other to love and good deeds. Okay? So the problem with anger is that it doesn't stir up love and good deeds. It tends to stir up more anger, doesn't it? When one person angry, the next person gets angry and it gets worse and worse. And anger makes us say things that hurt others. Even, even if we have a correct righteous anger towards sin, sometimes we can lose control. Right? Can it quickly cross over? That righteous anger can quickly cross over to, to sin. And that's another reason why Paul wrote, never let the sun go down on your wrath, right? Take care of it quickly. It's just going to get worse. So love is not provoked. Can you imagine, we just, this is my last point, can you imagine Jesus losing his, his temper? Imagine when the Roman soldiers are beating and, and mocking him. It, you know, it's... In my life, I can only stand, you know, being mocked for so long before I just get up and leave the room or I, I start giving it back to him. But Jesus never did. We never see him sort of making mocking comments back because God is love. 
Love puts up with injury. Love puts up with the abuse. Without being provoked. This is Jesus is the perfect example. And you say, well, pastor, you know, we're not perfect like Jesus. And that's true. We're not perfect. We're sensitive. We feel pain. And a lot of times we want to fight what's rightfully ours or when someone wrongs us. Well, there's more about Jesus if we keep going in the Word of God. Uh, well, it just so happens that he is sensitive and he feels pain. But in this instance of the cross, he never fought back. Now, Jesus could have easily started a revolution. He could have really played on the populist idea that the, the Jewish people hated the Roman government. And, and uh, he, he could have stood up and said things at the false trials with all the lies. He could have uh, hired a lawyer and, and got about you know, all this mess of the false imprisonment. I mean, the Roman government had very strict rules, and if Jesus would have pushed the matter, the governor would have had to let him go. And then he could have sued the Jewish priests that wrongfully imprisoned him, legally speaking. But Jesus didn't do any of those things because love was not provoked. Also, because it was God's plan for him to die. And he... As we wrap things up, I think we're going to end it there today. Does anybody have any comments or things that they want to say? I kind of talked a lot today, didn't give you the opportunity for comments. Anybody? Here. I have, uh, you mentioned uh, tongues. Tongues. first started yep. the lesson this morning. Um, I worked with a lady, and uh, there was a young girl that we worked with. And uh, she was killed in, a, in an accident the night before. And when we heard about it, this lady was a lady preacher. Uh -huh. And uh, she just started speaking in tongues. And nobody could understand it. It was just like something repeated over and over and over. And to me, that doesn't seem what that means. Right. I, mean, I would think that it would be something that someone could, anybody could understand. Yeah. But that seems to be what the tones are. Yeah, and Gibberish. it was it was to edify himself, you know, in that thing. So yeah. Anything else? So I think we got through what eight eight of the descriptions of love, eight or nine. Uh, I have that spreadsheet. I'll try to get Kelly. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, you have to be able to put others before yourself. The people who have that personality, how do you, how do you even, if they aren't seeing it, they're not going to see it. Mm -hmm. You say, what do you do other than pray for them? How do you confront that? Well, I think you have this, the key, I think you'd have to, besides pray, would be just keep loving them God's way. You know, I, I, I think that's the epitome of hard love. Yeah. When the person is so, you just want to choke them. <laughs> <laughs> you do. You can. You, you would just. You, I mean, that's raw. That's me. That's my problem. It's hard to not become judgmental on my part. It's hard to not want to scream at that person. You know, throw it right back at them. It's just that is like the hardest thing. Mm -hmm. you can Maybe that's my love block, is not confronting it. But then I don't know, is that wrong on my part? Well, I think uh, uh, there could be a situation where confrontation was necessary, or uh, just exposing the truth of their, I mean, sharing the truth of what's really going on in light of Scripture. You know, that can be a form of confrontation, sharing the truth. Like, don't you see this? I don't think they can. 
Well, it's the same way in our world right now. It's, there's this cult that is basically being forced upon us, and we can obviously see that they're wrong, and we're told right to our face, no, this, this is right. And we're like, no, it's not right. <laughs> doesn't make any sense. And uh, so, yeah, unfortunately, sometimes it takes a while for people to see, uh, come to the light, anyway. Anything else? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this time together here in Sunday school. And Lord, as we study these descriptions of love, uh, Lord, help us in our everyday lives uh, to be more loving. Uh, Lord, we fall short so often. I know I do. And uh, we uh, need your help uh, to, to tell the truth and, and love. Uh, each other all the time. In Jesus' name, amen.